these two Italians would probably have a glass of wine, you know, at the end of all of the day, and then they would, and, uh, Aldo Aiello would go to our ambassador, and our ambassador would send me a cable and say, you have to adjust the mandate to such and such a way. I would write an EUN resolution, and I'd send it up to, to UN in uh, New York or our delegation, and they'd say, Stanton, you're driving us crazy. You're trying to get us to adjust the mandate every three months or every three weeks. And uh, we never do this in the UN. And I said, well, you've got to because that's what's needed for peace out there. And I think there's some movie called Separation. We were, de we were connected by two degrees of separation. And then finally I met him. And since that time, uh, he has done so much uh, for genocide prevention. He's the chair of the Genocide Prevention Advisory Group. Uh, he's been so involved. He's the, he's the head of the community of St. Egidio here in the North America, uh, a very important organization that has negotiated peace in many places. Uh, he is a very committed man who cares. And believe me, it is a pleasure to work in his school. So without further ado, I just introduce to you Dean Andrea Bartoli. Thank you. Um, happy to speak from one place or the other, probably. Here is better with the mic. Um, I'm giving you a welcome on a second day. It's a very curious organization of the, of the program. And I thought about it as a as an invitation to, um, I can see that my voice is not projecting well enough, so I need to come closer. Um, it's an interesting invitation to welcome you to your own second day. Uh, it's clearly a gift to be welcome anywhere. And very often we are not welcome in our own country. The world is not a welcoming place. So to have a place in which we can encounter ourselves as workers, as people doing something meaningfully, is definitely an important task, is an important opportunity to reflect. But it's particularly important when we realize that in many ways we are the words we use, that the words we use are actually enlarging, or in many ways establishing the degrees of freedom that we are using, that we are offered, that we are entitled, that we are given. When we are unwelcome in our own country, where we are unwelcome in our own world, when the words that we use are for many the um, lamentation of the oppression that is crashing on us, to have a moment like this in which new ideas are possible is indeed a gift. We are not only who we are in isolation. We are not only who we are where we are in our cities, in our villages, in our region, in our mountains. But uh, we, are, we are together, and there is a connectivity that makes us stronger in a way that we discover when we are uplifted from where we are alone. I think that the very reason of this conference is to reconnect and re-energize. And I was very happy to see that. Freedom needs that. The desire of being better needs that. The struggle is long and it's not easy to be on the struggle when the forces that are oppressing are so strong and powerful. But we can find the words we need to find. We can share the words we need to share. We can keep the words that we have said in the past and find the new one the one that will energize not only those who are here this morning, but the many who couldn't come. Not only those who are here this morning, but the many that for years have kept 
the passion for Sudan so much alive. Not only the words of us here, but the words of many over there that cannot travel or had to travel out of the violence in their life. So I want to recognize that one, you know, for first uh, observation, the speakers of yesterday were great. It was a great beginning and a wonderful day. And definitely very good sessions, very good working spaces. Uh, the need to work precisely, not just in genetic terms, but specifically on, on uh, goals and actions and possibilities. I wanted to stress that uh, from our perspective, I'm the dean of the School for Conflict Analysis and Resolution. We are sitting at the School of Public Policy. We are in the midst of uh, um, George Mason University. We are particularly interested in this conference as one of the best examples of knowledge and policy. And I know that uh, we will continue with this encounter and conversation today. And I think that it's important for us to realize that almost nothing that we do of relevance in international affairs these days uh, is not connected to knowledge. And that the knowledge is not just an objective matter. It's not just a problem of counting something in a distance and aseptic way, but rather participating with the desire, as I said, of something that makes us freer, better, more human, that is actually incomplete, that needs to be uh, taken in order to be made complete. So I just wanted to welcome you once again to your own work. Uh, welcome you offering and uh, celebrating in many ways the collaboration with George Mason University, and stress the importance uh, of uh, the words that we share, knowing that the world in which we live is indeed made of the world that we are using. Sharing the commitment of liberating hope, sharing the commitment of honest work, sharing the commitment of respectful polity, I think we are moving, not just us, but large communities and possibly states and the international community from a position of willful neglect that was the long time, 60 years from the moment of signing of the convention in 1948 to a policy of commitment. So welcome again and thank you very much. Good morning, everybody. Um, I'm Elizabeth Blackney. I'm with Act for Sudan. And I'd like to welcome um, our panelists. Thanks, you. Thanks to everybody for getting here so early. I know we had a long day yesterday and an inspiring day. Hopefully, this will be, um, give us some practical information about, um, about how to transform media coverage of Sudan. Um, we have Rosalind Jordan um, with us from Al Jazeera. And she has an amazing, amazing insight. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. For and we have me. the former U.S. State Department spokesman with us, P.J. Crowley. And Josh Rogan is here with us today from Foreign Policy. So um, without any further ado, we'll get started. Rosalind, would you like to start for us? Sure. sure. Um, I'm a oh, pinch wow. hitting. <laughs> fellow Red Sox fan. Um, I am pinch hitting for my producer, Camille El Hassani, who is very sad that she could not be here today, but we've been working on one of those stories where when the person finally says, yes, I'll do the interview, we have to go. So she corralled me Friday and said, I need you to do this. I will go take care of this interview because we have it. But go talk about Sudan because we have been spending a lot of time talking about Sudan. Um, I know that these are just introductory remarks, so I'll try to be brief. One thing that really puzzles me about the U.S. media, and I've been a part of the media for 23 years, is why we get so fixated on some stories and then why we cover them in a certain way. 
And one thing I have seen and have really come to understand in my last five years being at Al Jazeera is the frame in which we approach stories that are outside of our community. And for better or worse, we all resort to the easiest image mainly generated by Hollywood in order to try to approach our news coverage. You can't take the people out of the journalists. That said, it does not excuse us from trying harder. To wit, one thing I noticed when I first got to Al Jazeera was this real temptation or almost crutch to open every story that did not take place in the United States or in Europe with people dancing and people beating on drums or people blowing on flutes or music or something that said this community that we're about to show you to whom we're about to introduce you is primitive because they all they have time to do is dance and beat on the drums and the longer I looked at these stories and then started looking at our competition which has been the BBC, the BBC does this in every single story. If you go to Southeast Asia, you're going to see people squatting over pots of rice or trudging through rice paddies or herding cattle. You're going, if you go to the Andes, you're going to see people in colorful knit hats blowing their pan pipes. It's, it, it's just never ending. They will argue my British colleagues in particular will argue, we're trying to establish a sense of place. As an American, as a descendant of Irish immigrants and African slaves, I will say you're trolling in stereotypes. This is no better than going to Boston and then trying to figure out, okay, where are all the undocumented Irish immigrants and let's go see if we can find them you know, dancing in toe shoes. Really, would you do that? No, you would not do that if you were trying to cover a story in Boston. So what I think viewers and readers have to do, particularly when it comes to radio, when it comes to television, and when it comes to online multimedia elements, which do involve video and sound, people who are reading and thinking about the news need to say to these organizations, you need to find another way to tell the story. You need to get us beyond these stereotypes because unless you do that, then we can't talk about, well, what happens once there's an Independence Day celebration in Juba? And then how do we move on to actually building capacity, actually creating an economic system that will help Sudan and South Sudan work out their oil issues and then help South Sudan actually create an economy that will not just be completely dependent on its oil reserves. So I'll just leave it there and then we'll talk about whatever you want to talk about. Thanks. PJ? Um, it's a pleasure to be here uh, from the other George down the street, George Washington University. Um, and, and a lot of what we're talking about here is actually you know, part of what I teach now at GW uh, on public diplomacy and strategic communication. Um, I actually think that uh, Sudan is doing better than you think. Um, and, and I know part of the premise of the panel is, you know, darn it, you picked up the Washington Post or the New York Times this morning and Syria was on the front page, but Sudan wasn't. Uh, and I, I would argue that the, you know, the most important determinant of Sudan uh, media coverage uh, is being made at the State Department right now uh, in, in that there will be another special envoy uh, for Sudan replacing Scott Gration and then subsequently you know, Princeton Lyman. Uh, and and it, in fact that's to some extent the nature of news. Uh, it, it is event driven. It, it is institutional driven. Um, public opinion regarding these issues uh, is elite driven and, and you have a uh, tremendous cadre of uh, elites who are focused on Sudan, you're part of that uh, effort. Uh, so I, I think the, uh, while there clearly there has been a 
shift, as, as Ross was talking about, uh, you know, to the crisis du jour, and right now that's, uh, su that's Syria. Um, it, it doesn't preclude uh, attention returning uh, to, uh, uh, to issues of, of Sudan. Um, thinking from my two years at the State Department, where, where you know, Sudan was a, a, a admittedly a more prominent issue at the time, it, to some extent you've got to understand you know, what, what drove uh, the conditions that drove that, <coughs> uh, that coverage. Uh, obviously, you had a, a new administration you know, coming into office, uh, picked up the comprehensive peace agreement, uh, and, and moved it towards uh, independence for uh, South Sudan. You had uh, a couple of subplots, obviously, uh, given the, uh, 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 the warrant uh, regarding President Bashir of Sudan, how would the administration handle that? You know, the, the tenuous nature of the U.S. relationship uh, with the ICC. Um, you had, uh, you know, different subplots within uh, the Beltway uh, in that, um, uh, you know, Scott Gratian, friend of the president, went to work for the Secretary of State, who had been a rival in the 2008 campaign. How would they get along? Uh, you know, my friend Josh here, uh, you know, the, the whole issue of the specials, whether it was Richard Holbrook, whether it was George Mitchell, whether it was Scott Gratian, were they eclipsing the, the Secretary of State? No, <laughs> we argued within the State Department, but that didn't preclude, uh, you know, some coverage, you know, to that effect. Uh, um, you had an active process in the Doha process. You had a, an impending crisis, obviously, if the uh, follow-on negotiations on the CPA had failed. We had the real prospect of uh, a resumption of the Civil War. You had something that approached a deadline or, or a clock ticking, if you will, uh, you know, towards uh, decisions that led to uh, the independence uh, of, of South Sudan. So I, I think uh, uh, part of the challenge going forward is, is to kind of recreate some of those you know, conditions. I mean, a, a last ingredient obviously was um, uh, the uh, you know, personal involvement by the President of the United States. Um, the good news here is that you have in John Kerry as the Secretary of State, someone who uh, has been himself directly engaged uh, in this issue, and, and one would anticipate, uh, I mean, he, he's all about, you know, walking into the middle of crises uh, and trying to uh, advance them, whether it's in the context of Afghanistan and Pakistan, uh, climate change, uh, you know, or, or South Sudan. So there, there's good news there, but I, I would think that um, once there is a special envoy, he or she uh, will, uh, you know, help to create, you know, some new uh, dynamism surrounding this issue. Uh, but I think uh, as every White House, its first term is about getting reelected. Uh, its second term is about legacy. Um, there, there, there is a, a, a reasonable legacy for the Obama administration in the first term. Uh, uh, and, and things did advance forward. Obviously, there's an enormous amount of ongoing suffering and unfinished business uh, in the context of, of Sudan and, and, and its various elements from uh, the border and Blue Nile and South Corvon, uh, you know, to Abia and so forth. The, the real issue is come back to the White House in a, in a kind of a, um, a savvy political way and just say, let, let's finish the business. Uh, there are things that have to get done. Uh, obviously, the, the, the most significant votes in what gets done will be uh, you know, decisions made by Bashir and, and Salva Kiir. Uh, but but there, is, there is the opportunity to kind of recreate a dynamic uh, in, in the second term as, as the administration um, you know, works you know, to focus on its legacy. Uh, the dilemma, uh, final, final comment for starters, the dilemma is that the, you know, it, it is, if you think about traditional presidencies uh, as they become so-called lame ducks, uh, attention uh, shifts a little bit more significantly towards foreign policy in the second term. I think Obama's presidency is going to be the reverse. Uh, Obama's legacy is going to be on domestic policy. Uh, and, uh, and issues that get resolved regarding the, the deficit, the budget, and so forth. Um, so, so while he, I think he still has a handful of issues that he will want to 
uh, be part of his legacy. Um, it, it, the, the, the ability of the president to, to focus on these issues will be somewhat more limited than perhaps existed, say, you know, in, in a Clinton administration. Um, but uh, it's, it's just finally important to do whatever is possible to make sure that on that short list of things the president wants to get done uh, before he leaves office in 2016, uh, Sudan is on that list. Josh? Great, thanks. First of all, thank you so much for including me today. It's a real pleasure to be here. Uh, what I want to do with my opening remarks is uh, tell you quickly about uh, sort of my personal connection to the Sudan issue, tell you a little bit about what I think is going on in my industry and in journalism, and then give you some practical advice on how to uh, deal with people like me and to get your stories into the outlets that... Uh, with great care. <laughs> <laughs> um, I first uh, became involved in the Sudan issue in 2003. I'd been living in Japan for two years. I'm a Japan hand by training and uh, was determined to become a lawyer and uh, I went to work for a law firm uh, called Berger and Montague in Philadelphia and uh, they were doing class action plaintiffs litigation on behalf of the people of what was then Southern Sudan against the government of Sudan and a uh, talisman oil company. Uh, they were using a very uh, unique uh, strategy, it was something called the Alien Tort Claims Act, which is a sort of a, like an 18th century law that has been revived by the activist community. I'm sure many of you are familiar with it. And they were trying to attach the assets of, West, of Western oil companies that were contributing to the genocide in Sudan and use those assets as a lever to pressure those co companies to divest in Sudan. It was a very long, tedious process, and I was the paralegal, and, uh, and my job was to collect research on what was going on inside of, in southern Sudan, especially in Juba and Blue Nile. And um, um, what we found at the time was very shocking information. Now it's sort of um, well known, uh, but at the time we found a lot of what, uh, information about what the Chinese especially were doing in southern Sudan. Um, our case, plotted along, eventually Talisman did divest, uh, an Indian company took up the slack and uh, the abuses uh, continued. Um, but the information that I collected, I eventually uh, put into an article that ran into the Straits Times of Singapore, it was an op-ed, and it was about Chinese actions in southern Sudan. And at the time, it contained a lot of new information, and uh, two things happened. I got fired from that job. <laughs> That's a true story. Uh, apparently, the part, senior partners who have been working on this issue for 20 years did not appreciate the 22-year-old paralegal publishing uh, in international newspapers. Uh, but also, that article, uh, you know, traveled around the world. It was picked up by oil industry uh, press, by Asian press, by African press, by the human rights community, by the advocacy community. And I got a call from uh, the Japanese newspapers called the Isai Shimbun, and they said, that was a, we didn't know any of that stuff. Why don't you come down for an interview? And three weeks later, I was a reporter. Uh, and I moved back to Washington, and I became a journalist. And I've been doing that for ever since. Um, and uh, So a year. What's that? So, a year. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, yeah, so, uh, so Sudan was the reason that I became a journalist. And uh, ever since then, I've followed it very closely and tried to uh, pay the attention that I think it deserves. Uh, that's a long way of getting into, uh, you know, sort of uh, what I found when I got to the journalism industry, which is essentially that journalism is a mess. Uh, it's total chaos. As it turns out, journalists do not make good businessmen or necessarily good managers and definitely not good CEOs. And all of the companies that I've ever worked for, with a very uh, distinct exception of the one that I work for now, foreign policy, have been uh, at, at their core, very dysfunctional, right? At the same time, uh, the newspapers and uh, outlets that we all deal with uh, failed to, they were about 20 years late to this thing called the internet. They thought it was all gonna be a fad. And then sometime in the 90s, they realized it wasn't. And then sometime in the aughts, they realized they better do something about it. So they're, they're way behind. Uh, this came in an era of cutbacks, a destruction of their model of doing business. And the, these cutbacks severely impacted coverage of foreign policy, especially in major news organizations. Mm -hmm. So what you had was uh, major papers uh, cut down their staffs covering the State Department, covering these issues, and especially doing foreign coverage and investigative journalism, and you all know this. Uh, so the few reporters that were covering foreign policy of these major news organizations often practice a journalism uh, 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 pattern that I call seventh grade soccer, which is uh, today the ball goes over here and everybody runs over here. And then the ball gets kicked over here and everybody runs over there. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, they wake up in the morning like, okay, we're doing foreign policy. Today's Libya Day. Okay, what's going yeah. on in Libya? And today's Syria Day. And then today's Afghanistan Day. And like maybe once every three months there'll be a Sudan Day. 
And uh, you know, it's, uh, you get very surface coverage. You get a commodity story, which means you get 50 people writing the same stuff. Uh, not a lot of added value, and not a lot of expertise within the journalist community on any one of these issues. Uh, this is all, these are all uh, big problems, but I'm not here to tell you that the journalism industry is totally full of problems because, uh, you know, in this darkness, some people have lit candles. And uh, what we've seen is a proliferation of new and, and, uh, and interesting outlets and venues. Uh, so while, while the major papers are in uh, severe decline, uh, there's all sorts of new outlets. And these new outlets have a very low bar of entry. And it's a much broader, flatter media scene. And uh, I'm a good example of that because I never worked at a major paper, but yet I was able to get c continuously uh, better jobs in journalism and do good work, you know, that's mostly internet-based and is maybe written in a, a, a newer style, but still I'm able to practice real journalism. So that's, I'm lucky, but that's, that those opportunities are, are multiplying. Uh, what that also means is that uh, these outlets are more specialized, uh, they're more targeted, and um, it's a more of a meritocracy. So, uh, you know, less do journalists rely on the brand of the organization that they work for. It's more about the journalist's personal brand and their personal interests. Uh, okay, so meanwhile, while all this was going on with our industry, the way that people uh, consumed journalism on the internet changed. And then it changed, and then it changed again. And it continues to change. And it turns over about every 12 to 18 months, in my estimation. And let me take you through that very briefly, because I'm going to tie it all together in the end. You'll see. So. <laughs> Uh, in two, 2006, 2007, 2008, when I started really writing on the internet, uh, it was all about platforms, right? The idea was a journalism organization would build a beautiful website and it would have pictures here and lists here and a, a graphic there and a Twitter feed there. And, you know, the, it was sort of like, if we build it, they will come. If we just make a beautiful website, everyone will want to get to work every day and click on it, right? That worked for a couple of years, right? Then uh, 2009 came and uh, this thing called, it, the, the, the game moved to search. And we saw the rise of companies that figured it out that people don't go to websites anymore, they go to Google or Yahoo, and they type in what they want to read, and whatever comes up first, they're likely to click on. Uh, so this, was the, this saw the rise of sites like the Huffington Post, which made hundreds of millions of dollars gaming search. They figured out how to get their stuff to the top of the search results. Uh, the problem with this, of course, is that people are not writing for humans, they're writing for an algorithm. They're figuring out what does the computer want to mm -hmm. find, right? And, uh, but that worked for about two or three years. And then 2011 came and it turned over again. And we went to what? Social. So no longer do people even go to Google or Yahoo to, to figure out what they want to do. They consume news largely uh, by uh, um, filters through their trusted sources. So this could be Facebook, it could be Twitter, but don't get caught up in social media or new media, old media. There's no such thing as the new media. There's no such thing as the old media. There's just the media. And uh, the medium is, doesn't matter, right? Uh, so, you know, the point is that you get information from people that you trust, circles that you trust, communities of interest, and you depend on other people, whether it be aggregators or news websites or your Twitter feed or whatever it is, to filter this crazy amount of information and pass you the things and push you the things that you are likely to be interested in based on your patterns and your relationships, right? So we went from platform to search to social. And we're in social now, and we're in the middle of it. We're not even at the beginning of it. Mm -hmm. uh, so this is, uh, the way this affects a writer is that instead of writing for an algorithm, you write towards what people are likely to share, what people are likely to notice, what's likely to get through the, the, the opaque mass that is the, you know, the internet and, and break through. Uh, okay, so let me now take that into what that means for you and how, you can, how that, you can take that information and uh, do your jobs better. So uh, the idea here is that uh, most people, I mean, I get pitched every day, most people uh, you know, uh, focus on those few outlets that they think are the biggest or the most credible, right? Uh, but again, those outlets are not the best recept rec places to receive your pitches, right? What you want to do is identify all of the, the, the specialized writers and the specialized media who are focused on what it is that you're selling. Uh, there's, if, the, if you are interested in uh, you know, rice subsidies in 
you know, Ethiopia, there are 10 bloggers who are super interested in just that specific issue. And it's going to take you a little while to find those guys and then meet them and reach out to them, but I trust you they exist, right? So rather than go to the New York Times and try to sell them a rice subsidy story, which they may touch for half a paragraph three months after you talk to them, you know, start from the bottom up. Use the trade press, right? Use the people who are invested in, all, in your issues. They're, they're, they're sitting there, they're waiting uh, for your call. Uh, also, people in the, in, the, in the internet media don't have uh, the structural limitations, right? I can write about it as much as I want, whenever I want, however I want. Uh, so it's much, you know, we're, we're start for content. So, you know, find those people who are looking to write more, who are more aggressive, who are not, you know, trying to f cover a beat, people who are, have some sort of passion or interest, right? Uh, then what you want to do is you want to cross communities of interest. Uh, so, you know, when I want to hit a big story, what I'll do is I'll find a story that has a sort of like a media angle plus a national security angle plus a social media angle. Uh, when I used to cover uh, PJ here, uh, we found several good examples of that because he was both a government figure and he was a social media personality and he, uh, you know, said crazy stuff that impacted foreign policy and national security. Uh, so Thanks, Josh. Yes. <laughs> it was great. It was great, great stuff all the time. Uh, so. For, for example, my Sudan story, right, the first one that I ever wrote, it, it was an oil story, it was an Africa story, it was an Asia story, it was a human rights story, right? So if you can find the nexus of those communities and then use that to your advantage, uh, you'll be able to cross into different uh, uh, um, um, parts of the specialized media and create sort of a buzz that reinforces itself. That's how you drive bigger stories and maybe get outside of your comfort zone or the, the three or four uh, media outlets that you're comfortable working with. Uh, craft your pitches individually. If you're sending out mass emails, you're already doing something wrong, okay? Uh, never send out mass email pitches, right? They're the easiest things to ignore. We get a ton of them. We don't read them. Uh, you know, the, 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 what I was talking about, journalism being a pure meritocracy of individuals, is, is relevant here because I can't write a story that's not exclusive. If I get an email that's been sent to a thousand reporters, I ignore it because I know that somebody else at some wire you know, in Nairobi is going to be able to type that up faster. It's not worth my time to try to out-type somebody who's just going to type it, uh, you know, somewhere else within the next 30 minutes. So everything should be an exclusive pitch, and everything should be sold as an exclusive pitch. The best way you get a journalist to return your phone call is you say, I've got something exclusive for you. I'll call you back right away. And then think about what that journalist is writing, be familiar with that journalist, is, with what that journalist has written, and, uh, and craft your pitch to that journalist. It takes more effort. Right, but it's worth it. Uh, for example, from my, I like dirt on the Obama administration. You know, I love <laughs> stories about how one part of the administration is fighting another part of the administration. Have you guys know any of those stories? Write me an email. It's J O S H <laughs> dot R O G I. Write it. I don't see you writing. At gmail dot com. I will take that pitch. Uh, I like conflict between Western actors. I like. Uh, personnel moves. You, any of you guys know who the next special envoy is going to be? I would publish that. Let me know, even if you're not sure. Maybe you think you know who it's going to be. Send it to me. I'll check it out. Yes, somebody knows? Oh, no. Okay, we'll talk after the panel. Uh, you know, so this is all a long way of saying that you have to, it's about relationships. Uh, I remember once PJ called me in one of his more angry moments. Uh, at one of my stories, no. yes, and, and, uh, and he said, uh, you know, he was complaining that I had emailed him a couple of questions and then written something. And he said, why didn't you just call me? Why didn't you, you know, we could have talked it out. And uh, he, the, he, I'll never forget, he said, uh, you know, journalism is a contact sport and advocacy and is a contact sport. You know, you have to have the relationships before you make the pitch, right? Uh, the easiest pitch to ignore is from someone I don't know. Uh, you want to... Uh, be in contact with the reporters and journalists that you want to work with, even when you're not selling something. You know, the best advocacy uh, uh, um, uh, um, people that I deal with are the ones who contact me when they're in town, uh, when they're not selling anything specific. And we just talk for an hour over coffee or over lunch, and we come up with ideas together, and who knows where, what, what might come out of it. Um, okay, so I'm going to uh, give you one last example. So, uh, one big story that came out of that is uh, the Child Soldiers Protection Act. Mm -hmm. And this was a story that I've been covering for three years. So for those of you who aren't aware, it's a law passed by Congress by Democrats, uh, most, uh, sponsored by Democrats, which said that the U.S. shouldn't sell weapons to countries that fail to make progress on their uh, you know, use of child soldiers. 
And every single year, the Obama administration has waived all of the sanctions with uh, justifications that range from perfectly legitimate to perfectly ridiculous. And uh, nobody, the first year that they did it, they, they didn't tell anybody. There was no conference call, there was no press event, there was no briefing. They just put out like a one-line email. Hey, uh, we're waiving PL blob 102367. And, you know, I saw it, I didn't know what it was. I got a call from, uh, uh, I'll, I'll name check, Joe Becker at Human Rights Watch. She was the one who brought this to my attention. And then I called some people at World Vision and some people at CARE, and, and they explained it to me, and I broke the story about how the Obama administration was uh, ignoring this law, and sure enough, uh, you know, that kicked off uh, a process by which they started to exp make justifications, talk to communities of interest, uh, hold conference calls. The next year, they handled it much better. They still waived all the sanctions, but at least they told people about it. And, uh, and uh, the third year, they waived all the sanctions again, but at least they came up with less bull bullet explanations. So, you know, <laughs> <laughs> I never would have known about that if the uh, human rights community hadn't brought it to me, and, and, uh, and if I hadn't written about it, nobody would have. Uh, so that's a good example of a, a positive constructive relationship. I'll stop there and uh, I'll take any questions that you have. Thank you. Great. Thanks, you guys. Um, and I'm going to ask a couple of questions of the panelists and then I'll open it up to questions from the audience. I'm going to be really tough on the mics, so be nice to my mic assistants. Um, we, um, we want as many questions as is possible, so please keep them to questions, not speeches. And, um, and we'll get started with that in just a second. Um, PJ, I'd like to start with you. On the... We, we talked a little bit before um, the panel about the CNN effect, um, something that we, in the advocacy community, we always want to know how to make a story relevant to reporters, and I think you all address that um, in, in kind of comprehensive ways, but if you could tie that together, there's, you know, often questions. Yesterday, um, Ken Isaacs gave us a rather inspiring um, talk, and we, you know, everybody always asks, why, why not Sudan? Why Syria? Why Libya? Why, um, and it's, it's the seventh grade soccer, they're running from story to story. How, how in the advocacy community can they, um, can they take advantage of or find a way to get through to having a CNN effect? Is it really about the individual pitch? And, and since you've been the guy who gets the calls from people like Josh, who get calls from people like Susan Morgan or myself. Um, how can we help drive more media attention? And does that actually affect it? Does it compress the time frame? How, how can we do that better? Well, the, the CNN effect uh, came out of um, the experience in Somalia. You know, whether the pictures that of, of uh, the tragedy that was unfolding in the early 90s uh, in Somalia uh, forced the Bush administration to uh, send troops, in, in essence, to make a decision it was it would not have made. And, and the, the scholarship on that uh, has been that that it may accelerate the decision-making process, but it doesn't necessarily change what you know what a, a an administration would do. Uh, and and now you you know the CNN effect's been followed by the Al Jazeera effect. Mm -hmm. It's been followed by the Twitter effect or the Wiki effect. Um, I mean, publicity is uh, never hurts, mm -hmm. uh, but but it, it it has to be matched with a institutional capability. Uh, I, I I do think that uh, you know, picking up on a little bit of what what Josh was saying, that um, <laughs> um, while the domestic the U.S. domestic news hole for international news is shrinking, absolutely. Uh, I mean, God bless the New York Times. They have three reporters based in Africa. They're probably the only major news organization, U.S.-based uh, news organization that, that makes that kind of commitment. But the international news hole is actually expanding. And, and you know, uh, uh, Josh was talking about, you know, Asahi Shinbun is actually one of those global newspapers making money. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, and, and, and Al Jazeera and Al Jazeera English, um, you know, provide a, a very significant uh, you know, Nietzsche as well. So I, I would say the, you know, what's essential here is is no high-level visit to Sudan should be uh, should go unaccompanied. Um, mm -hmm. You know, the topic of Josh and, and my early conversation at the State Department regarded um, a a truly incredible diplomat named Richard Holbrook, 
Um, if, if Richard went to the region, uh, he never went alone. He always had uh, journalists going with him. Uh, and, and there is, as you've hinted, this I I aspect of investment. Mm -hmm. uh, if, if you get a journalist engaged in a story, if you get a journalist on the ground uh, in Sudan, for example, uh, he or she is going to write one or more stories based on that investment of time. Uh, so uh, I, I would say that, that as you look at you know, the, who are the figures who can drive, uh, you know, drive some you know, attention getting figures, whether it's a UN official, whether it's a US official, or an official from some other country, since nominally the Doha process is still uh, ongoing, mm -hmm. um, you know, make sure that there are journalists that are walking the same ground as, as they walk. Now, later on, you'll have you know, one, of, one of the great, uh, and he's a friend of mine, so I can call him a gadfly, John Prendergast. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I mean, John is expert at this. Uh, and, and I think that, that's, that's what you need. So, so the, the fact is that since the Obama administration is going to replace Princeton Lyman, that necessarily means that they continue to see Sudan policy uh, above and beyond you know, just the the day-to-day -day challenges that Johnny Carson has as the Assistant Secretary of African Affairs. Mm -hmm. So th that's good news. Now the question is how do you exploit uh, you know, that individual and that ongoing policy focus you know, to continue you know, to move the administration together with others who have an interest uh, in Sudan uh, you know, to, uh, uh, you know, to, to move in a direction that is, uh, that is constructive uh, and, and puts the appropriate pressure on you know, the various parties to reach decisions that obviously they've been resisting for the last uh, you know, couple of years. One thing I will uh, say, touching on something that you just said, PJ, is that it's not just about trying to help figure out or advocate for one person or another to be the new special envoy for Sudan and South Sudan. Mike Posner, who is the Assistant Secretary dealing with human rights issues, is also leaving the State Department. And because of the outstanding war crimes indictment of Bashir, you're going to want to know who could be your allies in the State Department dealing with human rights issues. And that helps drive you know, more you know, pitches from them to the media to do the coverage. I will say, as someone who works in TV news, that it is very, very difficult to get any network, US-based in particular, to commit to actually doing in-depth, prolonged coverage because it all costs a lot of money. And when Josh talked before about exclusivity, it had better be something that we will never see on any other channel because then the very highest level bosses will say, I thought this was exclusive. I can't justify spending this money to our shareholders. And when you're dealing with the US media, that's an unfortunate fact of life. I used to work at NBC News, and that is a fact of life. It's one thing if, when she worked there, Ann Curry could do a story, or a, do a trip, I should say, to Darfur, and take a look at what was happening with the human rights situation in Darfur, but she was a frontline anchor and she was able to get command of more resources, producers, photographers, a security team, the time to actually you know, spend on the ground for a week or two weeks, gather material, talk to people, listen to people, and then have multiple places where she could run her stories. An ordinary correspondent, such as myself, even though I have a beat, it's a lot harder to get that kind of coverage. Now, Al Jazeera and Al Jazeera English are very, very good at trying to get to places where other TV networks are not. However, there is still pending the opening of a bureau in Juba. That offer has been out there inside the network, outside the network for more than two years. We've had no takers. And I think that's partly because a lot of people who otherwise might be persuaded to want to do foreign news coverage don't see that anyone, one, is trying to hire 
Two, you don't want to hire a kid straight out of college because you need, a, you need some street smarts and you need to know how to handle yourself in an environment that is not the one in which you grew up. And then they don't want to trust something that critical to U.S. foreign policy to just anyone. So you have this barrier, even at an international news network, where the people who are most willing to go in are not the people that you want to have because they're not ready to tell those stories. If I could clone myself and be there, I would be there. But I would also want to clone myself and leave myself at Guantanamo Bay to cover all of the military commission trials that are going on there. And then if I could clone myself again, maybe I would try to make my way back into Beijing because we're going to try to put a Beijing correspondent back in country and try to cover China's influence, not just on Sudan, but in Mali, in Ethiopia, in Somalia. But I can't be in all of those places at once. So if you know people who are trying to get into journalism, get them beyond trying to be the local news anchor and try to get them actually engaged in doing real work that's actually going to matter to people. One thing that I have also found is that everyone will say that Americans don't care about foreign news. Americans are xenophobic. Americans say we spend too much money on foreign aid to other countries. Why do we even need a State Department, really? First cabinet agency, but why do we need it? But if we were to make the commitment as an industry to consistently cover what is in many ways a flat world and show Americans how connected we are, then people will start to expect it. And then my final point on this is that um, as someone who does, um, who has worked in the mainstream media and not in any specialized media, um, I also am very much aware and grew up of reading the black press. And personally, I find it shameful that there is almost no coverage of foreign policy beyond what's happening with Nelson Mandela's health. I also find it absolutely, absolutely shameful that with at least two major television networks that supposedly have a public service commitment BET and TV1, that there is no consistent coverage of international news involving people with roots in the African diaspora. It's, uh, we don't push enough for this coverage. We don't create the demand. So the mainstream media is not going to put something out there if it doesn't think there's a demand for it. Sorry, just a, a couple of things. Uh, I, was, I, I wanted to talk about what PJ said about the special envoy system. Uh, he identif we identified a couple of people to watch the administration who replaces Princeton Lyman, who replaces Michael Posner. I would add Sam Power to that list. Mm -hmm. uh, I think who, sh who replaces her will be important. Uh, I think she's expected to replace Maria Otero at the State Department. Mm -hmm. And I would also add uh, what happens with Susan Rice. Does she go to the White House and who replaces her at the UN? Is it Bill Burns? Uh, these are all personnel right. moves to watch. But, uh, you know, I wanted to go ahead and disagree with PJ on uh, his comments on the significance of uh, the fact that the Obama administration will appoint a special envoy. It's my personal view, based on my reporting, that the special envoy system, while ambitious and aggressive when it was announced in 2009, uh, has been essentially uh, um, uh, stripped of any of, of the influence that it, uh, that was intended for it. And, uh, you know, I mean, listen, that's just, you know, things happen, and it just so happens that this White House has uh, a more control over foreign policy decision making uh, than most, uh, than any other administration I've worked with. That's their prerogative. It has good and bad effects. Uh, but, you know, you could read Vali Nasser's book, and it's all about how the White House undermined Holbrook. Uh, you guys follow Gratian. You know, what was he really in control of? And, and it's not just a matter of, and, uh, you know, I would put Stephen Bosworth or the current North Korea envoy. They're not making North Korea policy. They're, you know, they're implementing it. So it's a, you know, you could, ar I could argue either way that that's a good thing or a bad thing. But, you know, let's not over romanticize the existence of a special envoy because it depends on what they're empowered to do. 
Uh, it also depends on what their priorities are, and I would go back to Gratian here because, uh, you know, it was my experience. I loved covering Gratian because he said a lot of crazy stuff, and uh, that made for great copy, and he didn't care at all what the White House think or what the State Department thought for that matter. His policy was Gratian's policy, and it didn't have to match anybody else in the whole world. You didn't know you had it so good when it was on the front page of the Washington Post talking about cookies. Yeah, cookies and, <laughs> cookies and gold stars. I like cookies and gold stars, but maybe it's not going to solve the Sudan crisis. So, so uh, you know, so... So yes, follow the appointments, uh, and starting with the White House and moving out, uh, but also follow it, what are the priorities of that, these people, because mm -hmm. someone who has a job like Sam Power is dealing with crises all over the world, what level, where does Sudan fit into that list is more important than, you know, uh, and whether or not she, her view seems to be winning the, the day internally. Uh, that's important. And then I would say, like, you know, there are people outside of the executive branch who I found to be really, uh, uh, good, and I would, and I just would mention uh, Chris Coons, the senator from Delaware, mm -hmm. uh, who has been amazingly uh, active on Africa. Uh, I think in a very constructive way. Uh, so if you can't get your answers you want from the State Department or the White House, uh, you know, please uh, uh, avail yourselves of your congressmen because they they can have influence from the outside. I'll move on to the next question. Great, thank you. Um, we've got Faith McDonald. Go ahead, and then. Hi, Faith McDonald from the Institute on Religion and Democracy. And my question is for Josh. Uh, you brought a real blast from the past. <laughs> I worked a lot on the um, alien tort reform lawsuit with Charles Jacobs and uh, thought we were going to actually go somewhere with that until the judge was it, killed in a hit and run accident who yes. was going to accept mm -hmm. it um, and then the next judge wouldn't. But my question is, what do you think today would be the equivalent of the Alien Tort Reform Act to use in terms of Sudan? What can we get the most media coverage on and actually try to make a difference with? Okay. Thanks. So, yeah, so the, alien, the, the law firm that I worked at that was using the Alien Tort Claims Act, they did not want media coverage, hence my dismissal, right? So, uh, you know, that is a, a process that's separate from what you guys are doing with the same goals but different strategies. It's, it's a very long game. Uh, it's played out over decades. Mm -hmm. uh, now, what is the equivalent for the advocacy community? Off the top of my head, I would have to say, uh, you know, divestment and uh, focusing on the divestment issue. So you can pressure corporations or governments or, you know, as far as foreign military sales go, uh, as far as U.S. taxpayer dollars are used to finance uh, armies in country and give direct aid. These, these, these are the levers that you have at your uh, disposal. And these corporations do respond. Uh, to divestment, they do respond to bad publicity uh, when it's uh, when it's uh, shined upon them, and they do care about the veneer of corporate responsibility, and and uh, so that's the sort of shorter game to 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 match what the the class action suits are doing on the legal front. Uh, so I think the, that's sort of also something that journalists can easily comprehend and understand. Uh, it's something you know bashing on corporations is is fun for all. And uh, that's something that, like you, you know, we're 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 game for. Uh, now, you know, the problem, of course, is that if you're in the best case scenario, if you get Western corporations, the ones who can be embarrassed into divesting from Sudan, to divest from Sudan, uh, then less scrupulous uh, companies from less scrupulous countries uh, fill the void. You know, where there is demand, there will be supply. Uh, that's not an issue I have to teach you guys about. You guys know that better than me. Uh, but in terms of getting media coverage, yeah, I would I would. Uh, suggest divestment stories as one option. Great. Um, my name is Esther Sprague. I have two questions. The first is um, there's a growing opposition within Sudan, and I'm wondering if you have tips on how the opposition could go about uh, gaining more attention, what they could do, the kind of steps they could take to um, encourage more press coverage of their activities. The second is, um, you know, I think the debate in around the world is, uh, you know, countries I think understand the government of Sudan and its character and, and uh, how it treats its people. But I think the big question is, uh, what's the best way to impact them? Is it through engaging with them or is it more around isolation and pressure? And um, as we're seeing sort of a more visible relationship between Sudan and Iran and some of the terrorist organizations, the people that are for engagement would say, well, we haven't given them any choice. Um, they need friends, and so they're reaching out. 
people that are for isolation would say they've always been friends with it and they're just being more visible about it now. So I think um, as this, we're looking at a new special envoy and I think that's always the, the question in the administration is which is the best approach? And one of the candidates that I've heard about is um, former Sudan, uh, for, former U.S. ambassador to Sudan, Timothy Carney. And if you look back on his work, he primarily has been for engagement. And so um, I think. Okay, Esther, I think, I think we, we have the yeah. question. Well, PJ, would you address well, that, please? Josh Actually, thank you. Have a file, so. Thank you. That's, that's good. Thank yeah. you. Go ahead. We have limited time. <laughs> Um, to, to disagree with Josh's disagreement. <laughs> <laughs> We're getting very meta here. I, I, no, no. Um, I mean, it, having an envoy, but also having a process. Uh, and and the, the, the question is, you know, whether it's the Doha process, uh, whether it's the, uh, uh, the, you know, the charter, uh, the tripartite agreement, whatever the case may be, ha having something that, that brings uh, the international community back together, um, and then who are the parties that get to be uh, engaged in that process? There's been some encouragement of having the SPLM North, you know, be a part of the process. Sudan is balking at that, obviously, uh, but that 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 is a stage in which you know all of the relevant stakeholders get to uh, get to play, and and then the you know there there is something to the. Uh, the naming and shaming aspect to this, uh, you know, which countries uh, are playing a constructive role um, and which countries aren't. And, and, you know, so John Kerry was just, you know, in Doha. I, I assume that he had a talking point on, uh, on, South, on Sudan, South Sudan as, as part of that. Uh, but, one, you know, this year, one of the uh, very significant stories is going to be, um, you know, how President Obama gets along with Xi Jinping. Uh, you know, finding a way to make sure that Sudan becomes part of that discussion, uh, I, I think will be uh, will, will be uh, you know particularly you know relative but relevant. But but, but having a process where uh, various stakeholders, uh, NGOs get to kind of you know say you know who's who's part of the problem and who's part of the solution. Uh, that, that those become that 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 can take on a a constructive dynamic. Um, uh, I, the other thing is just you know where do we want to be in in, uh, in in January of 2017? Uh, what do you want to see in in terms of uh, Sudan policy or South Sudan policy? And, and then you know you know chart a constructive path having, I mean, the, the value of having a special envoy is you have a conversation. Uh, and, and that person's not, you know, worried about, you know, Cote d'Ivoire today, not worried about South Africa today, not worried about the implications of the Kenya election. All of those things are very significant. Mm -hmm. you, know, you know, he or she is focused on, um, you know, how do you overcome the existing obstacles uh, regarding the relationship between Sudan and South Sudan. That can have uh, uh, you know, uh, influence, um, and, and then uh, inviting the special envoy to have a private conversation and a public conversation. Mm -hmm. uh, all of those things can have influence, but it, it really is pushing the administration through the special envoy to the Secretary of State, to the National Security Advisor, to the President. Uh, where do we want to be in January 2017? And what is the role for each one of those people, uh, you know, to get us there? I mean, an aspiration would be, uh, you, you've had a visit to Juba, you know, by the Secretary of State, uh, you know, last year before she left office. Uh, could you envision the Secret Service will go crazy? You know, could you envision a, a visit by a Vice President or a President mm -hmm. to Juba uh, before he leaves office? Uh, if you if you can get that as part of the conversation. Uh, it, it, you know, potentially it could uh, it, it could develop some momentum, and Josh is exactly right that mm -hmm. that you know Samantha had an enormous amount of influence, uh, as did Gail Smith at the White House, and mm -hmm. and uh, uh, you know who will pick up the mantle uh, with their either reshuffles or their departures. Uh, I wanted uh, to uh, take the uh, sure. the really quick point about the opposition in Sudan. 
um, if you compare it to the opposition in Syria and before that the opposition in Libya, we've, we in the media have now had two experiences with an incipient opposition and it takes time to organize, it takes time to figure out the priorities, it takes time to play the politics within the opposition. We saw this with the Friends of Syria meeting last week, which was almost scuttled because there was some sort of dispute within the opposition about whether Western capitals had been harsh enough in their comments about the latest fighting in Aleppo. And that was a, that would have been a huge embarrassment for Secretary Kerry if that had not gone forward. That said, reporters now know it's going to take a while for an opposition to get itself together, to figure out what its priorities are, what it's willing to do with Bashir's government, what it's not willing to concede. And so while they're having these debates and arguments among themselves and trying to scope out a policy, I can think of five correspondents who work at Al Jazeera English who are on the continent right now. They all roam around. Peter Gresti is closest, he's based in Nairobi. But you have Haru Matasa who can come up from Johannesburg. Ivan Ndege is more than willing to get on a plane out of Abuja. Mohamed Val and Mohamed Addo tend to hang around the horn, to, you know, doing something or another. They tend to do more longer form stuff, but if there's a good way to meet people, to actually spend a few days in country, they will come in. I'm always interested in trying to find out what's happening in Sudan, but as an American, I will tell you, it's a lot harder for me to get in, to get a visa. But these six, seven people I just listed, you email all of us. You talk to us, you know, as Josh said, individually, and say, here are some of the things that we're worried about. Here are some of the issues that we have with this government or that government. Here are some of the things that we're seeing happening. You know, you start building a catalog of the work that you're doing, and you maintain an ongoing conversation with these reporters. People will then have a basis of knowledge that's not surfacy on which to draw. They will have information that they can then use when they go to a briefing or to a meeting with this official or that organization and say, why haven't you been paying attention to this or why aren't you doing more of that? You have to see this as a long-term issue. You know, just having cameras come in and just having reporters come in with big names and big reputations for one big splash doesn't help the people at the end of the day. So think long-term, you know, and be willing to accept critical questions from the reporters. That's our job. You know, if something doesn't look right, something doesn't smell right, we're going to ask, so why are you doing this? What's your real motivation? Don't be offended because if we're asking the question, believe me, there's a government official who's going to be asking that question too. And if you can't satisfy the public sphere, you're not going to get the buy-in that you're looking for from one government actor or another. So, great, hey, thank you. Yeah. yeah, and Josh, address that quickly. I've got a lot of questions and yeah. not a lot of time. So um, I've got, I think, six or seven people with their hand up. So I'm not gonna probably be able to get to everybody. Very quickly, I just Go wanted ahead. to address your question on engagement versus isolation, right? So I don't have a view personally, which is better. What I will say is that uh, this administration has leaned more heavily towards carrots than sticks. Uh, as compared to previous administrations, and in terms of, uh, well, it's just a fact. Again, you know, I, like you could, you could judge for yourself. Has that been successful, right? So uh, it's also leaned more towards private engagement on human rights rather than public engagement. And that's something that I know people in your community are not very happy about. Uh, so that those are calculations, right? And. Uh, 
you know, I could point to failures if I, if I wanted to. If we had more time, come see me after. I'll give you a list. On uh, okay. how to get the opposition more press coverage. Couple, you know, one easy trick is uh, to troll the Obama administration. In other words, you know, if, if someone's criticizing Obama, you'll, you'll, that's a good way to get covered. Little secret reporter's trick, right? A lot, a lot of, uh, one good way to do that is to find a congressman who agrees with that opposition members. There's plenty of, I mean, there's 435 congressmen. You're gonna find one guy who thinks that that opposition group, whatever it is, they're, that they're spot on and they, they've got it exactly right and they're gonna write a letter about it and do an interview and, and that's, the, you know, that's, the good, that's a good way to get some free press. You know, if you get desperate, you could even track down Dana Rohrabacher, but use that one as a last resort. <laughs> or and, Jeff Fortenberry of Nebraska, he right. actually is very interested in Africa issues and in human rights issues and he is considered a conservative Republican. Right. So you can find an ally anywhere on the Hill. You, you just have to go yeah. knock on some doors. And the last thing is bring these guys to Washington. I know reporters are lazy. Yeah. You know, put somebody in front of us. Or we can't get a plane ticket make, approved. Make our job easier. All right. All right, great. Um, Andrew, go ahead. Uh, thank you. Uh, the, uh, this is concerning the media coverage of the Sudanese resistance. That's important because... To some of us, the Sudanese resistance uh, presents the mess, best cost-efficient method to end the genocide. Mm -hmm. uh, in 2008, three reporters, from the New one from the New York Times, Lydia Polgren, two from the Washington Post, Stephanie McCrumman and Craig Timberg, mm -hmm. covered somewhat favorably resistance victories in combat in Sudan. They all one lost their job, one was transferred to Metro, and one was transferred to New Delhi. Mm -hmm. Since then, no reporter has covered the resistance in any meaningful way. Uh, now, the, qu the question is this. Uh, there are some reports of a $20 million fund to affect PR on Sudan. If this fund is being applied to suppress news of the resistance, how would they go about doing that? PJ, do you want to start there? I, I don't know anything about the $20 million. Who's $20 million fund? Going to PR firms on Patreon. Being paid by who? Cartoon. Cartoon, right. Which ones? <laughs> not, not Which firms? <laughs> <laughs> that might be a question for after the panel. No. <laughs> I'd write that story. Yeah. There's no. documentation on the proposal. Mm -hmm. the people, uh, the people who is this the Lanny Davis situation? No, it's not the Lanny Davis situation. Okay. Right. Let's talk about yeah, that Lanny after the panel. Yeah. So, so. I, think you I think you have an audience. <laughs> no. That example of a successful pitch right there. No. <laughs> that right there. And then here. Thank you. My name is Ahmad Noor. I'm uh, president of the Darfur People Association at New York. We have rally uh, with Amnesty International and Act for Sudan in front of UN. And the act, uh, Amnesty International brought like 500 activists and we Act for Sudan and other organizations with our four people association at New York organized big rally in front of UN. And there is also a few uh, Libyan and people from, Yam from Yemen they have rally also at the same day. And there's media, there's Al Jazeera over there. I walked with uh, Sharon more than two, three times. Sharon Silva, so she's right mm -hmm. there. We walk over there, we ask the media to cover. We have press release and everything. The Al Jazeera guy told me we have order to not cover anything from Sudan, anything. Was I beg him to, was Al Jazeera. This, was this Arabic or was this English? It's Arabic, yeah. Okay, I work for English. That's the same. Yeah. So, no, it's yeah, they're no, same. Two, no, two yeah, different it's channels. The same dad, anyway. Two different channels. But anyway, finish your point. And uh, the second, uh, they cover for the Libya, they cover for uh, Al Yemen. And there's every half hour press release from the White House, they cover all, of, all that. And they don't cover the genocide, which uh, Al Bashir killed more, over half a million or three million and more than four million displays, they don't cover even for just one minute to know the world, ensure that there's genocide going on in Sudan. 
Thank you. Well, I will say first, I cannot speak for Arabic. It is a separate channel with a separate editorial policy. A lot of people get that confused um, because we all say Al Jazeera at the end of our stories. But they have a very different audience and very different concerns. And if there is a choice between covering a rally about atrocities in Sudan versus the civil war in Yemen, their audience is primarily interested in Yemen. That's what they're going to cover. As far as English is concerned, we have reporters in and out of country all the time. One person whom I cannot name because she's actually doing something somewhat undercover is actually in country right now working on the very issue you just raised. Things also don't happen quickly in TV. People seem to think that, you know, if I just walked up with a microphone, boom, it's on television. It doesn't work that way. And even though we are a 24-hour news channel, there are as many stories as you can imagine with nearly 200 separate countries where there's something compelling happening in each one and we have to make a choice. It's not always the seventh grade soccer game, but there is a finite amount of airtime and how much time we can commit to a certain story. There also has to be a minimum standard of what is happening. Otherwise, we could just have newscast after newscast of this happened today in Sudan, this happened in the United States, this happened in France, this happened in Papua New Guinea. And people watching that newscast or reading our website wouldn't learn anything and wouldn't be moved to do anything more, to actually pick up the phone and say, you know what, I'm going to you know, call my congressman, or I'm going to write a letter, or I'm going to join an organization, or maybe I'm going to take a job and try to go and see if I can help. You have, it's not just about you know, hits, runs, and errors, to use the sports analogy. You know, it's about actually making people care, actually get out of their lives and think about somebody else's life. And I will also tell you one of the dirty little secrets, particularly of TV news, is that both here in Washington and in New York, there's a rally every day. There are people demonstrating every day. There are bullhorns, posters, candles, whole nine yards. The National Park Service here in D.C. is very busy monitoring and giving out permits for all the rallies. It's a nice picture, but it doesn't tell the audience anything. We would much rather spend time with the organization that put together the rally and show them lobbying members of Congress, actually talking with the leaders of corporations where they want them to pull out their business interest, or actually organizing some sort of effort to build a political movement or to build economic capacity or to provide basic health care. Those are the kinds of situations that people not just in the United States, but anywhere in the world can connect to and feel as if, okay, I have a better appreciation that this is the struggle that someone is going through. You know, it, you know there are some people who get really fixated on having you know, the big puppets at the big rallies outside the World Bank and the IMF. It's theater. It's not putting food in a child's mouth. So, you know, so think about that. You know, think, a, you know, it's a little harder. It's a little more time consuming. It's definitely more expensive, but you make that investment in the time, we can make the investment and get our bosses to buy in to be there. So, you know, but again, I can't speak for Arabic and why they wouldn't, ch why they wouldn't cover you. So, thank okay, you. Okay, great. And we have a couple of extra minutes as we're waiting on John Prendergast to join us. He's en route. So um, I'll be able to take another couple of questions. Um, Dr. Greg Stanton? Yes. And then. Someone back here um, earlier mentioned uh, the name of Tim Carney as a possible special envoy to uh, Sudan. Mm -hmm. I have known Tim Carney for over 30 years. 
He was our CIA desk officer in Bangkok for Cambodia for well over 20 years. And then he moved into uh, Cambodia under UNTAC, uh, was supposedly in charge of the human rights uh, picture in there. He was still CIA. Um, Tim Carney brags about having constructed, under Brzezinski, the coalition between the Khmer Rouge, the royalist Khmers, and the anti-communist Khmers. He brags about it. When I saw him a few years ago, I asked him, what are you doing? He says, I'm a big game hunter. I kill elephants. This is not the man who should be our special envoy to Sudan. And we need a question. And the question is, who should be our special envoy? And I, I especially want to address this, of course, to PJ and to Josh, because they are absolutely right. You have to follow these stories and really keep your tabs on who is going to get appointed to these very key positions. Okay, great. And JP has just arrived, so um, I'm going to take this gentleman's question, um, and, then, and then we'll take a short break. Go ahead, sir. Thank you for having me. Uh, I'm Guka Shakari. I'm a Nuba American, U.S. Army uh, linguist by profession. My question to Al Jazeera English, I'm glad to know there is a difference between uh, the English and the Arabic. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, concerning uh, the Nuba Mountains and the genocide, ongoing genocide in Nuba Mountains, mm -hmm. do you see in Jazeera English they did enough really to cover the current situation in Nuba Mountains? And will you promise yeah. me, at least, you said it's very hard for you or uh, some journalists to go to uh, Sudan. Mm -hmm. uh, is there any way, uh, can you just tell us the reason why is it hard to go through South Sudan, to go to meet with our leaders like Commander Abdelaziz Al Halu in Nuba Mountains, mm -hmm. and to see these people whom they are uh, hiding in caves. And, uh, uh, and my second question is very, really quick uh, regarding the uh, Sudan, uh, Sudan Peace Acts. Mm -hmm. um, I'm just asking, my question is, I didn't see any participations of African Americans human rights activists in this panel since yesterday. Is it a coincidence or is it because there is no one? Thank you very much. Uh, very quickly, um, the situation I referred to a few minutes ago with the reporter who is in southern Sudan right now, that's part of the work that she's doing. Peter and Mo Ado also go to Sudan and to South Sudan on a regular basis. So we are very much aware of the fighting of the people who are in fear of losing their lives, of losing their families, of losing everything. And we are very, very much following that. Um, as for where are the black activists, the African-American activists? That's a good question, I'd like to know too. Great, and um, if we could just get a quick closing remark from each of you, then we'll take a quick break and get the party started again. No break? No break? <laughs> Uh-oh, it's on. All right, go ahead, okay. DJ. Um, I, I do think that uh, there's the potential for uh, a, a renewed focus on Sudan. Uh, and I think the real issue is, is press the administration to try to figure out what uh, the leg what they want their legacy to be uh, on these Sudan issues uh, and uh, and then uh, you know try to press them you know what are the what are the uh, the particular opportunities to help get you there so if you can if you can create a political vision help create a political vision for them uh, uh, and and a, a considerable amount of pressure um, I, I think you'll you'll recreate the same dynamic in the Obama second term that we had for the first two and a half years of the first term. Great, Roz? Um, we could talk about this all day. Um, and if I had a magic wand, and if I had a cloning machine, I would clone myself so I could be everywhere. Because it's very, very important, particularly that Americans who do spend a lot of money comparatively speaking, on foreign aid. They need to understand where the money is going, and they need to understand why it matters that the money is going to try to help other people have 
what we're very lucky to have in this country, which is I don't have to worry about police knocking on my door in the middle of the night and spiriting me away and my family wondering what happened to me. So we could, we could talk about this all day, but engage with me. I will engage with you, and we can try to make this better for everyone. I just wanted to thank you again for uh, including me today. It really is my honor and my pleasure to be with you here. Um, you know, my overall top line message is that, uh, you, know, um, you know, an object at rest tends to stay at rest, and that's how I <laughs> approach covering this administration. And, uh, you know, um, we can sit here and speculate that John Kerry, who has been more for forward leaning on Sudan than uh, as a senator, uh, might change that. Uh, but, you know, that's not determined yet. And where you sit is where you stand in this. Uh, government and uh, he is one player and not even the major player uh, on foreign policy. Uh, so uh, the the second term Obama administration policy in Sudan is not written, and uh, their inclination is to do uh, uh, less rather than more. Uh, it's they're a very busy group of people with a lot of pressing challenges. Uh, the good news is that they can be influenced and they do respond to pressure. And that is your role and my role as well. Uh, so what you are doing is important. It can move the needle. Uh, keep it up, and uh, if I can help, please let me know. Thank you. Great, thank you.